bad religion. Hope you guys have been grabbing some information from this, grabbing some truth from this, and applying it to your life. Um, as I've shared week after week, bad religion is something that is real in our lives and in our culture. Bad religion is something that's infiltrated our churches, infiltrated us personally, and has affected the world around us. If you look at the culture that we live in, when people think of religion, it, culturally the word religion has a negative connotation. You know, when, when people hear that you're religious or when people even hear that you're Christian, usually it is followed by maybe a little bit of discomfort or they want to make sure that you're not going to be oppressive about what you're going to share with them. They want to make sure that, you know, like I remember um, the first conversation that I had with a, a family member, um, I was talking to them and, and, uh, and I was just like, yeah, you know, um, I'm a pastor and, and you know, if, if there's, because I hadn't seen him in a while, and, and I said, you know, if there's any questions that you have about, you know, Jesus or anything, and before I could get any farther, they interrupted and said, um, I'm not interested, don't talk to me, don't bother me with that stuff. And so it was just like, okay, cool. Um, so, I mean, I could sit down and have conversations with people. I'm hanging out, talking to people, and, and you know, we're just having a good time. And then um, all of a sudden, you, you know, they're like, so what do you do, you know, in this area? And I'm like, well, you know, I, I work at Easter Seals. I'm a paraprofessional there, and, and I'm a pastor. And they're like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> you know, and they're thinking, man, I was just using some really, really interesting words when I was talking to him. Um, but they don't, they, they, they often, we often get categorized with, with those types, those kind of peoples. The, um, um, for lack of a better way of saying it, sometimes we're seen as nutballs, you know, we're a little like crazy. I can't remember this church sign that I've seen before, but um, something about God wanting us to, um, um, oh, what is it? Something about developing the right kind of fruit, not, he doesn't want religious nuts. I can't remember the Maybe you guys can remember at some point and tell me later. Anyway, um, we don't need religious nuts. We've got enough uh, nutballs out there. I don't know where I'm going with that, but whatever. Um, so by definition, religion, as I've shared with you guys before, is it's a personal set of institutionalized uh, or an institutionalized system of religious attitudes, beliefs, or practices, or um, conformity. That just, that's uncomfortable, I know that we are called to a new way of life, and there are definitely uh, scriptures that speak to us that tell us you do things this way instead of doing things that way. You change, you change who you are, not in a way that that um, detracts from the way God designed you. I think all of our personalities should stay, um, unless you know the personalities are not godly. Um, and you're rude and inconsiderate and just plain mean, okay, that's not stuff that you add to your uh, faith, but there are definitely things that make us specifically us, things that are interesting, things that are unique, anywhere from our, the way we laugh or um, the way we interact with people. And those things are definitely a part of us, but conformity um, or, or an institutionalized experience in our faith is joyless and frustrating. And, you know, as we've been working through this uh, series, Bad Religion, we've been targeting just several different things. Last week, we talked about, um, we, we talked about uh, tradition, and we've been talking about just different things, whether it's tradition or, um, you know, requirements and living under the law or understanding that Jesus has given us full freedom and how we not only, not only have we been freed from, but we are freed to. You know, God's love and God's forgiveness did something marvelous in our lives, and because we are set free from the things that we did before means that we're set free to new things, to exciting things, to a new life. And so this morning, I want to talk to you guys about what it means to be the church, like what it really, really means to experience being the church. I'll start off with this phrase. We are more often insulated, or we more often insulate ourselves from the world. Unwittingly, we fear it. And, and, and so th this is something that I've seen. In fact, this is something that I've been guilty of myself. As a pastor, you just grow accustomed to your own community. Or we become this closed-in, hemmed-in kind of experience where, you know, sometimes 
when I've gone to other churches, thank God we have broken um, this and, and, and we are a congregation that people come in and they feel like really welcomed. There's a, there's a, a constant hum of conversation when people are coming in and they're just, in, we're, we just are people that enjoy each other and um, laugh together and even cry together. It's, it's, it's a beautiful community here. And we love to see people come in, but if we're not careful, we can become gated. We can become a community that only welcomes certain people. You know, I, I remember when I first started dating my wife, um, I went to her, her uh, grandparents' home where she was living at the time, and they lived in this community that had, they had built a bunch of houses there and everything, and, and, and so they, they like had a public pool in their community and all this stuff, and then I started to hear about certain things they weren't allowed to do. Like, the grass had to be at a certain, you know, mode a certain time. If it got, you know, to that, they got in trouble with the powers that be or something like that. Um, there were certain requirements that they had to live under, certain things that they had to do in order to fit in or in order to be a part of that community. And sometimes churches are like that. They, they close themselves in, they gate themselves, it becomes a gated community. And if you don't fit a certain mold, you're not welcome. You can't participate. You can't be involved. And that's awful because what that does, as we've been talking about in bad religion, is it alienates people and keeps them from wanting to come in. Now, Jesus ascended into heaven and he gave us the, the, the promise to wait for his spirit that would empower people to do what he had called them to do. And that happened. Peter became, became this amazing motivational um, to the word and motivation to experience Jesus. And he preached this message after being empowered by the spirit and it changed thousands. And then in Acts chapter two, this, this thing began to grow. Oh, and, and unfortunately, from this experience, it's become too institutionalized, it's become too rigid. But if you go back to Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 42, you'll see just what was taking place. And it says this, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many mir miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money um, with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in their or met in in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy, and the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. And so this community began to develop. There were people being added. There were new things happening. There were miracles. There were uh, God created, Jesus uh, created miracles that were the result of their ministry and a result of their Holy Spirit empowerment, their Holy Spirit baptism. And, and so they were going about doing these wonderful things so much um, so. They, they valued and loved each other so much so that they were willing to sell what they had in order to help each other. This was a community that was the result of generosity. I mean, a incredible generosity. So much so that they sold property and they sold possessions and they shared what they had. Wow. Now that is community. That is an amazing thing. That is something that we can learn from, something that we should allow to affect us. We should be people who say, at whatever the cost is, we are going to provide for one another. We are going to support and help the ministry of what is happening in our own church, in our own community, in our own place. And I believe wholeheartedly as we begin to see these things happen, there's going to be a deep sense of awe as God does what God does. You see, if you look at the, the Greek in 
what the word translated religion, it also means worship. Worship is powerful because true worship is passionately pursuing the greatest commandment to love God and to love people. In Mark 12, 29 through 31, the most important one answered Jesus is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your, or our God, the Lord is one. And verse 30 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And so religion or faith or Christianity had been not boiled down, but it was uh, something birthed from these commandments. If you look at the Old Testament, if you look at the, the laws that Jesus or that God gave us, if you look at the scripture where Jesus told us to live a certain way, if you look at the Bible and, and you look at it in its entirety and you begin to discover the things that God um, asks of us in our faith, you will see these two things becoming very, very apparent. The things that we do are birthed out of a love for God. The things that we do are birthed out of a love for others. The things that we become, what Christ does in us, the change that happens in us is something that results in love for him and love for others. That is the greatest act of worship to passionately pursue this truth. Now, we know that in certain, transla tr certain translations, it says that we care for widows and orphans. If we look at the context of James, all right, we'll see that, that those were the, the people that were in great need of that day. In the message translation in verse 27, it says this, anyone who sets himself up as religious, but talking, by talking a good game is self-deceived. This kind of religion is hot air, and only hot air. Real religion, the kind that passes muster b before God the Father, is this. Reach out to the homeless and loveless in their plight, and guard against corruption from the godless world. When we experience Jesus, do we express Jesus? When we experience Jesus, do we express Jesus? Think about that for just a moment. We have an experience with Jesus. He changes us. We, we have this mighty moment where God, um, by his Holy Spirit, draws us towards Christ, and we develop an understanding of where we are and where we need to be. We develop an understanding of how wretched we are, how broken we are, how devastated we are, how desperate we are, and we then suddenly, through all of that darkness that begins to um, remove, we, we begin to remove that darkness from our eyes. We are no longer blind, and we see what's real. We see who we are. We see what's going on. We then experience Jesus. We experience his love. We experience his forgiveness. We experience freedom. So we experience Jesus, but then do we express it? We experience him, we begin to love him. Do we express it by loving him? Do we express it by loving others? Do we express it by going towards those who are loveless, those who are, are, are loveless in their plight? Do we go towards those who, who need love, who need compassion, who need support, who need help? Or is our religion nothing but hot air? Are we corrupted and godless? We experience Jesus, but do we express Jesus? Do we, do we allow ourselves to become who he is to others? Are we brave enough to love in a way that might, might, might require pain? Are we brave enough to love in a way that, that shows people who Jesus is by our actions and then bold enough to express to them verbally who he is? Maybe knowing that, you know what, if I say this, it's going to um, not go over so well, but I'm going to say it anyway. And so, I've had opportunity to be bold about my faith. I've experienced Jesus, 
And now God, by his grace and his ability to work through me, I've begun to express Jesus. I begin to share who he is. I begin to share with others what he has done. You see, the church, real religion, real religion, not bad religion, real faith is relentless devotion, not casual indifference. This is real. It is relentless devotion. It is an intense pursuit. It is chasing after God with vigor and with absolute uh, desire and absolute hunger for what he is going to do, what he can accomplish. And we've got to ask ourselves, is our community committed like, like, like the church, like the early church? Is our community committed like theirs? Am, are, is our community, is our faith, is, is our church committed like the church that was born of Jesus' love and immediately after the Holy Spirit interacted with those men and those women? Is our church like that? Is there a deep sense of awe? Now that was a deep sense of awe because I was able to experience something supernatural. If you know, just to tell you the scenario and the way we were traveling, there is no good reason why I should have been able to see him. And God worked in me supernaturally to be able to do this. But do we have a relentless devotion? Or are we casually indifferent? Have we grown callous to the world? Have we been, have we been uh, callous to the situation, the predicament that we see on the news, that we see in our social media, that, that we read about every day? Have we become indifferent to what is happening? Have we become indifferent to um, um, injustices? Have we become indifferent to slavery that still exists today? Have we, have we become indifferent to the very real issues that exist in our country? In other countries? Do we have a real faith, has heartfelt affection, not bored formality? Awe overwhelms the mind to get to the heart. It does. It does something amazing. And our faith is not simply about getting the truth right, but having the truth capture our heart. Think about this for a minute, okay? This is not about us getting it right. This is not about us understanding what it means and, and you know, like, okay, um, I'm just going to increase in my knowledge and my intimacy with God. And the truth is, is you can grow deep, but the deep of, the growing deep, the rooting in of your faith, if it does not result in you doing something or going out there or accomplishing something for his ministry, sharing the gospel with somebody, if that does not happen as a result of your or um, being deep with the Lord, I would honestly ask you just how personally connected you are. You know, because I've heard people like, okay, well, I'm just going to spend some time with the Lord, and I'm going to grow in my intimacy. I'm going to st- study scripture. I'm just going to grow and grow and grow. And they just sit there, and they eat and eat and eat, and they never do anything with what they've been fed. They never use the strength and the sustenance that they've been given through the word to actually work, to actually go, to actually get at it, to do something. Are we, is it just, you know, is our heartfelt affection real or has it become a boring formality? Faith is boring if you do not allow Jesus to do something incredible. Bad religion is boring. It's formality. It is frustrating. We walk around and say, God, we want to see miracles. God, we want to do awesome things. God, we want you to just move in mighty ways. Jesus, we want a miracle. And Jesus is like, then get off your butt and do something. All right? God is like, okay, you know what? You're asking for all these things. You want the supernatural to happen. You want people to experience Jesus. You're praying for them to come to church. Go invite somebody. Go sit down and have a conversation with somebody. Tell somebody, okay? You are the conduit that I want to use for the supernatural, and all you do is sit down and pray. You know what, church? There's some things that we don't have to pray about right now to do. There are things that have already been told us told to us in the bible you don't have to pray 
to go out and share Jesus. You already know you have to. You don't have to sit back and pray, okay, um, is, it, is, is that the person you want me to talk to? No, it is the person that he wants you to talk to because that person is right there and we have been given a calling, all of us. I stand up here and I share with you every week. That is my calling, but don't ever assume that all of us aren't called to ministry. We, we've got this assumption like, oh, well, well, you know, you know, Seth, Pastor Seth, he was called into ministry. Uh, okay, my calling's just a little bit different than yours. Is it heartfelt affection or is it bored formality? Sacrificial generosity and not selfish ambition. What are you chasing after? What are you, what are you pursuing? I've heard this statement before, but life is more than paying bills and dying. We like to accumulate all these things. We're like, oh, this would be fun, and this would be exciting, and I want to do this, and I want to do that. And then all of a sudden, we have all these things, but our joy in them is temporary. It's like, oh, wow. Oh, <laughs> you, know, I, uh, you know, it was fun, but it's not fun anymore. Or, you know, it's, it just doesn't do much for me. There is something vibrant and exciting and dynamic and being truly generous. Oh man, I get serious thrill when I'm able to give somebody something. You know, I, I'm, it, it's a serious thrill to watch as, as God moves through my finances to be able to create possibilities for others. There is something truly incredible when I decide that the, the, the thing that I want, you know, like, like ooh, you know, those, those um, pair of pants would look really good on me, you know, I don't know. And, and like you're shopping Amazon, next thing you know, your cart's got like $140 worth of items in it, and, and then, you know, you're, you're just like, okay, let's cash out or whatever, and, and God quickens my heart and says, Seth, stop it. Do you realize just what people are going through, and what people need. And, 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 and if I can share this honestly with you guys, I'm going to, but, but you know, they, they, didn't have, um, they didn't have this storage where they just began to accumulate. I'm not saying don't save for the future, okay? Don't misunderstand me. Don't, don't cash in money that you have that is going to sustain your life. But what I am saying is act in compassion with the gifts that you've been given, Act in compassion with what God has trusted into your hands, all right? Don't be afraid to give something because you're afraid, oh, well, I don't have enough money or it's not big enough or, or you know, I, I don't have enough to do something with. You know what? God asks you to give in accordance to what he has given you. And so do something, give something, allow your money to be filtered into this church so this church can be a conduit to others and bless others, encourage others. It is a divine gift for us to keep these doors open so that people can come in here and experience ministry and experience God and experience the things that he's doing. So yes, give to the church, be radically generous. I am telling you, I am informing you right now that being radically generous results and God being radically generous with you, it will prove over and over and over and over again. They held nothing back. They were radically selfless. They were generous toward one another. Bad religion will just hoard. And, and, and there's contagious joy, not secluded cliques. This is back to that, 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 what I was telling you about gated communities. This is back what I was talking to you about, uh, hemming ourselves in. Churches sometimes appear to be uh, secluded cliques. Like, I don't know if I'm going to fit in there. I don't know if I'm going to look right. I don't know if it's going to work. I, I, I don't know. You know, I want to go and I want to see what's going on there. I want to experience some things. It'd be awesome. It, you know, I, maybe it'd be awesome. I don't know. But then I have to go in and I'm not going to fit in and I'm pretty foul and vulgar and people know me in the community and they're going to say, ooh, what is that person doing here? Oh, boy. You know, like, like, am I going to get those stares? Am I going to get those looks? Am I going to walk into the church and people are going to be glaring at me like, ooh, look who showed up. You know, like, what is it going to be like? You know, or, you know, and, and don't make it awkward, like, um, you know, don't go running up to somebody and say, oh, you made it to church, we know you need Jesus. 
All right, don't do, don't do that, okay? But seriously, like welcoming, affectionate, like just going after someone and saying, you know, welcome to the building, welcome to our fellowship, welcome to our community, inviting them to conversation, inviting them to engage, inviting them to participate in what God is doing here. It will create contagious joy, and that contagious joy will be something that they want, something that they crave, something that they deeply desire, something they hope for, a contagious joy that is birthed from the love of Jesus. All the devotion, all the affection, all the compassion became irresistibly contagious. I was just like, oh, you know, they grew. A sense of awe increased. I got to be a part of this. I got to go with this, man. This is awesome. You know, look at these people. I don't know what they got, but I got to have some of it. I don't know what they're using or, or what's developing or what's making them so happy. You know, I don't know. But, you know, I know that they don't drink a lot. I know that they're not, you know, celebrating with some of that something, something. I don't know whatever it is that you fit in for that something, something. But, you know, like there's something about them that I got to have. You know, when you walk into a place and you express joy, when people walk into a place and, and you know, they don't walk in and, and it's not one of those churches where people are sitting down looking misery, miserable and saying, okay, I'm in church, I got to do my weekly thing. Um, yay, Jesus. Oh. You know, some of us say inside, we're like, ooh, I'm delivered, but it's our face that needs deliverance. <laughs> I know how awful that sounds. <laughs> Almost looked like they were baptized in vinegar. Yeah. <laughs> they do. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> but, yes, when people, when we do a baptism later, there's not going to be any vinegar, I promise. <laughs> um, when people come here. Is it contagious? Is it contagious? Are they just like, oh, I got to have that. That's one of the, the reasons why our youth ministry is called Outbreak. It's kind of funny, like, what does that even mean? Am I going to catch something when I go there? <laughs> But the whole idea was our experience, what we're doing, what's happening in our teen ministry. It's contagious. I've got it. You know, it's something that that when they come, when kids come, it's something that they experience and they really feel like they need to have more of it. You see, God intends to make every genuine expression of true love, joy and worship to be contagious. Is our community like this? Is something happening like this? Is it true? Is it real? Bad religion, all right, bad religion is indifferent. It's boring. Bad religion is selfish. Bad religion secludes itself and ourself. But real faith, it's relentless in devotion. It's heartfelt in its affection. It is sacrificial in its generosity. It's contagious in its joy. And let me ask you this, okay? I don't, and I pray that we don't, want to be a comfort-seeking, an entertainment-addicted, a security-craving, approval-desiring Christian. I don't want that. That sounds awful. You know why? Because those are things that I'm trying to gain, gain, gain. If you are, if you are someone who's trying to get all of this, you know, comfort as in just like setting back, being easy, being chill, entertainment addicted, like coming to church and expected to be entertained, all right? Or security craving, like I just want to be comfortable. I don't want to have to worry about anything. I don't, you know, and God tells us not to worry, but, but we worship security so much that we don't brave, we're not brave enough to step out. What about you? What do you want to do? I don't want to be connected to bad religion. I want my faith to be alive. I want my faith to be potent. I want people to come around me and say, wow, I know that he's a pastor, but he is not stiff-necked. He is not abrasive. He is not going to push me away or insult me. He's going to love me, and he's going to be committed to sharing and being hopeful in his message. 
Not afraid to share Jesus and the fact that people need to be convicted in where they are. Not afraid of those things, but leading with love. I want our church to have its roots planted in the Word, and every time we walk out them doors, that we're not leaving a building we call the church, but we are going as the church. This place could cease to exist. This place, it almost did, but this place could burn down. Just all of it. Be gone. That would not cause this community to cease to exist. It does not matter if we don't have a building to meet in. We are a people. You go. You get out there. You meet people. You share Jesus. You do something. What about you? Where are you? In our culture that we're in right now, it is absolutely a must to silence bad religion and be the voice of Jesus. All these things that I see online, you know, it's like, oh, well, you know, gun violence would stop if fathers would spend more time with their children, you know, you know and, and it's true. You know, um, drug, the drug epidemic, ec- epidemic would, would, you know, fail and it would, start to, it would start to go down if families were stronger and healthier. That's true. You know, all these different suggestions, even from people of faith, you know, they're like, well, this would happen and this would happen if the family was stronger and healthier. This would happen or this would happen if education was different. I understand all those things matter, but I have yet to see some Christians put on their, you know what, the world's a mess. You know what it needs? Jesus. That's the answer. He's the answer. Period. End of story. That's it. Yes, you need all of those things, but I'm telling you, above all of those things, you need Jesus. Jesus Christ is the answer, and he will always be the answer, because he came to be the answer to our greatest dilemma, our brokenness, our evil, corrupted selves that would never be able to be enough. I want to be the voice of hope. What about you? What about you? Jesus, I thank you for today. I thank you for truth. May we begin to experience the delights and the contagious joy ourselves that we would be able to express, not just experience you, Jesus, but to express you. That our lives would be... uh, noticeable, that people would recognize us and say, wow, what is happening in them? What is taking place? What is making them different? What is it about them that I need to have? I've got to have that. And then discovering that it's you, Jesus, and then they would immediately say, I need you, Jesus. Change my life. Lord, help us to be that voice that we would be brave enough to step out, that others would have a sense of awe, that our community would grow, not because we want a bigger church, but because we want to fill heaven more. That we wouldn't try to build a kingdom here, but we would try to build the kingdom, your kingdom. I thank you for your direction and your clarity this morning. Help us to go do something about it. Amen.